السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله. اللهم زدنا علما ولا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ حديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم زدنا علما اللهم افتح مسامع قلوبنا لذكرك we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after glorifying and praising him and rendering hamd to him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send the best of peace and blessings and salam on our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his noble family. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the hearing channels of our hearts to his remembrance that our hearts may benefit from words of admonition, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That our hearts not deviate away from what Allah loves to that which he does not love. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this gathering of his remembrance. Today, inshallah, we will be completing this great surah which has been called the heart of the Quran so the final portion of this surah is from 69 to 83 which we will be covering interestingly this concluding part actually summarizes all of what has come before in the sections before. If you remember, the first section had to do with the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ, the Risala, and what the people would greet. Second had to do with story of the man from that Qariya with three messengers. And the third part was the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize him by in the universe. The fourth had to do with the reaction of the people of how they did and the last session in which Allah SWT mentioned certain things of Jannah and Nar and Akhirah and all of those now all of those themes are summarized in these last 14 last section so I'm going to challenge you with each ayah to relate it to something that has come in previous sections to see how many of you have reviewed it and have that uh, connection. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim wa ma allamnahu ash-sha'ra wa ma yanbaghi lah in huwa illa dhikru wa qur'anun mubin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and we have not taught him. Who is this him? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have not taught him sha'ar, poetry. We have not taught him poetry. He is not a poet. Why? Wama yambagila. It is not befitting. It is not suitable for him to be a poet. Now, and then, in huwa, this Verily, this Quran huwa illa dhikru wa Quran. This book is nothing except a reminder, dhikr. Al dhikr is one of the names of the Quran. Wa Quranum mubin, a very clear Quran from Allah subhanahu Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that we have not taught him poetry? Because the kuffar used to say, oh, he is a poet, he is made even though they knew him for 40 years and they knew that he had nothing to do with poetry but because they could find nothing else they said he is a shahir and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a whole surah about poets about shu'ara 
in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't talk very positively. In general, he talks negatively about poets with a few exceptions, except those who know Allah and believe in Allah and praise Allah and the Messenger. Everyone else, why? Because poetry, one, is exaggeration. There is a lot of implications, the understanding, you can understand the sh share this way, you can understand it this way, so people can take it different ways. Also, a lot of the poetry is done about things that are haram, like intoxicants, like sharab, and romances that are not permitted, you know, they are not talking about their loves and their beloved and all of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not encouraged it. Yet, what was the forte, what was the strongest thing among the people that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to, the Quraysh, what was their strength? Was it magic? Like Musa? No, it was poetry. They were very eloquent and on the spur of the moment, Filbadi, they would produce poetry, beautiful poetry. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enjoyed some poetry, but he was never a poet, so they could not, because this book, this revelation is for guidance, Qur'anum Mubin, clear. You can't have it in the form of poetry where different meanings can be taken and all of that, because it's a clear guidance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that we have not ta taught him poetry. And that this is a dhikr, a reminder, which is a clear message, a clear Qur'an. Which section of the Surah Yasin before talked about something like this? The very beginning of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about what the Qur'an is. It's a reminder and that it is revealed. In other words, he's not a shair. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here uses the word وَمَا يَنْبَغِي And it is not appropriate, it's not befitting him to be a poet. This word yambagi means befitting, has only come once before in the surah. Anybody remember? Yambagi? Yambagi. That it is not appropriate for the sun to follow the track of the moon. Okay. And we know the sun has been compared to who? Sirajum who been who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because they both give light. And the moon is lit by the sun. So the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are compared to the moon because they were lit up by the nur of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the, the companions were very strong in poetry. Abu Bakr Siddiq was very good in poetry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, yes, you all may be experts in poetry, but it's not appropriate for him because he's like the sun. So the word yambagi is used here. It's not appropriate for him and it's only used for the sun. And as we know, he has been compared to the sun. Okay. So there is an incident reported in one of the battles, the spoils of war, the Mal Ghanima, was being distributed. And one of the heads of the tribe, who was a new Muslim, was given equal amount <coughs> as everybody else. Because in Islam, everybody, foot soldiers get the same, horsemen get the same. It's not like, you are the leader, you should be given more. So he was a little upset because he was used to being given preferential treatment. So, he felt a little humiliated. People who I ruled are given the same as me. So, immediately he composed a poem. Which started like, Hamamtu baina akra wa uyayna. Means it started with, I have been humiliated between the two tribes that he ruled, akra wa and then the rest of the poetry that rhymed with this game. Now when people heard that, they started thinking, you know, it was causing some issues in their minds. 
So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told his companion, give him some extra so that he stops making poetry like this. Okay, so that ended there. Many years, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not know him. Many years later, he came and he introduced himself that I am that leader. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, oh, you are the one who wrote that poetry. And he said, Uyayna wa akra. He reversed the order of the words. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was sitting next to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, it's akra uyayna, because otherwise it doesn't rhyme in the poetry. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, what difference does it make? Because for him it was not a big deal. So Abu Bakr Siddiq said, Allah has spoken the truth. Ya Rasulullah, when Allah said, Wa ma allamnahu shara, Allah didn't teach you poetry. Yes, it makes a difference in the rhyme, but you have no clue of it. So this is just one incident that happened about this. So the next ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Quran. لِيُنذِرَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا وَيَحِقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ The Qur'an has been sent, لِيُنذِرَ to warn. And we've had warnings before in the Qur'an. مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا One who is alive. Now what kind of alive are we talking about? Obviously means somebody who is alive, but it also means whose heart is alive. Has this come before? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are nuhyil mawta. We give life to dead. Even if the hearts have got a little bit in it of life, Allah gives. So Allah gives life to dead hearts through his, through his book. وَيَحِقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ And the word of Allah has come true. Means when Allah has mentioned some punishment, it will come true, people will, whatever's promised will come to pass. Has these, have these words come, come in anywhere? Haqqal qawl. Ala, haqqal qawl, ala aktharihim, right in the beginning. That the word of Allah has come true on the majority of them, they will not believe. Okay. So it, it reviews and reminds us of that. That this Quran is just a warning, and we have been given warnings before. Allah gave a warning, and He told us what those were. He said, If you are arrogant, you have your nose up, then we'll put a, a collar on your neck, and you will not be able to see. There'll be a barrier in front. There was a warning that your hearts will be sealed, you will not be guided, and then you will remain a disbeliever. Then Allah's punishment will come like it came in part two for the ones who rejected the messengers. And then there is Jahannam, which is the final abode, which has been mentioned in section three and uh, four and five. So that is again reviewed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the word of Allah will be justified against the disbelievers who are dead to the warning, who are not hayyan, who are whose hearts are not alive. So Physical beating of the heart is not guaranteed that the heart is alive. Any heart that does not they recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or deny the existence is a dead heart, no matter how well it beats, no matter what certificate of health the cardiologists give that heart, it doesn't mean anything. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ مِمَّا عَمِلَتْ أَيْدِينَا أَنْعَامًا فَهُمْ لَهَا مَالِكُونَ Which means, أَوَلَمْ When it comes, أَوَلَمْ is, some, is an expression of uh, amazement. عَجِيب This is, you know, تَعَجُّب Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْ Do they not see? It means it's so obvious. What do they not see? خَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ مِمَّا عَمِلَتْ أَيْدِينَا That we have created by our hands. أَيْدِينَا What? أَنْعَامًا cattle. أَنْعَام is cows, goat, sheep, camel, all of these come under. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, 
do they not see that we have created with our hands an aman fahum laha malikun over which they have dominance they own them they are the masters now look at the logic look at all of those animals except the goats and all even the goats you can get a goat down and the goat can hurt you but cows and camels they can throw you any way they want they can you know yet a little child who is trained little girl sitting there can control a camel and have a hundred camels following them something to think about you see these they have the competition of horses but not among the anam you know how powerful the horse is yet these little girls are riding them controlling them making them jump making them walk in certain ways allah has given them milk milkiyat king dominance over them allah is saying it's not you who control them because they want they can buck and throw you off in one second the bull you know if you've seen any of the bull fights in spain they are powerful animals the fact that you have control over them is that allah has authorized that okay otherwise you don't so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying do they not see see is not just with your eyes but see with the eyes of the heart do they not understand that allah created all of this and when allah says by his hands we don't use the when say he says he has his hands allah has hands the way he says it but they are not like hands of ours we don't deny it we don't say allah doesn't have hands what he means by this is his power Allah says our hand we say he has hands but there is no thumb still we don't say the hand is like anything of any hand that we know and the only hands we know are human beings everything else has paws or claws or something Allah says he has hands he has hands that's it Allah says he has a shin remember the, his shin will he has a shin Allah sees he sees he hears he hears he knows he knows nothing comparable to human beings okay no tamthil no laysa kamithlihi shay there is nothing like the likeness even of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet he tells us that he has them so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of something what does this refer back in previous parts of the surah yasin anybody resurrection we have created these things and given them dominance over Allah is reminding you of his favors. He has mentioned many of his favors before in previous section. Look at the signs, see the signs. The sun has been subjected to you, the moon has been subjected to you. That this happens and you know the trees grow this and this all of that for you. Another reminder of favors of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala so you may be grateful. That here you are a owner. Now that's also there is another subtle message in If you are the owner the cows do what you ask them to do the goats do what they what you want them to do if they don't what do you do if they don't fulfill their purpose what do you do you sacrifice them or you get rid of them you sell them what does that tell you Allah has given you ownership that's how you treat what's in your control don't i have greater right on you because i own you and i own everything else so the animals can obey you should you not being the best of creation be obeying your master Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i think that's a powerful message powerful reminder isn't it that you dare to disobey your master where as these animals who you control they obey their master a little kid with a stick taking whole herd of thing going somewhere right you put you make you know pens and cages for them they go inside quietly obedient and you lock it for the night right so <clears throat> it's a reminder for us <clears throat> Allah says that we have subdued them 
we have lowered them to your service unto you. For minha rakubohu. Some of them you ride. You ride. Does this remind you of something else previously that came? Previous rides have been mentioned. What were they? Ships. Ships. This is another form that Allah says. You ride ships which weigh millions of tons of metal floating on water. Who enabled it for you? You have tons flying in the air. Who subjected it to you? And here you are riding camels, you are riding goats, you are riding cows. And all of them, Allah says, He has done. So you ride them, وَمِنْهَا يَأْكُلُونَ And from among some of them, you eat. You eat goat, you eat lamb, you eat cow, you eat camels. That you eat them. How can you control them? You try and attack. You see if a wild animal comes to the goat, or, or they run. The cows will fight them with their horns and everything else, they'll get together. Yet you come with your knife and they subject their necks to you. Now we've just had Eidul Adha. Something to think about. So again, teaching us to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His faith. We take these things for granted. Yeah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions from among the, in the next ayah, ayah number 73, same thing from these cattle. وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ وَمَشَارِبُ أَفَلَا يَشْكُرُونَ And from them are manafa, many benefits for you. وَمَشَارِبُ And drinks. Afala And all he asks is, are you not grateful? All Allah is asking is recognition and being grateful to it. What do we drink from these and these cattle? Milk. milk. Camel milk. How many of you have ever had camel milk? Fresh. Many people. Goat milk. Cows, buffalo, everybody, all different kinds, masharib. And each one is distinct. You can say, oh, this is this milk, this is that milk. Something comes to mind, I was told not to talk about it, but. What are the other manafe? What are the other benefits? Use their skin for your shoes. You, you use their fur to keep warm. What else do you use? Many other things can come from that. Insulin comes from cows, bovine insulin, and other things, right? Medicines. Many, many. I mean, at that time, they didn't know when Quran was revealed that there is going to be. We use heart valves from these animals. They put them into us so that we can live. Left it manafir, open. That's what we have. What we have found so far. What else we'll find of of benefits we don't know in the future. Again, when we have so many benefits coming from something like this, we should be grateful. And again, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has mentioned. People who are grateful and people who are ungrateful in previous sections. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 74, And they have taken, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aliha, gods, generic. Why? So that they may help them, they may assist them. Did this come before? Yes, they have taken other than Allah gods. And what has come before? Allah says, they cannot help you. And Allah says, if you seek help, seek help from Allah. So this has come before. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again saying that they have deified people and, and idols and stones and they worship everything. Including things like luck. You know, this is, I'm lucky. Yeah. 
and wealth. Wealth is worshipped in its own way. Money and power, the ultimate thing that is worshipped. If I have power, I control everything else. Wealth and everything comes under that. That you take all of those as ilah, as your God. And as Allah SWT mentioned, and you have taken their own hawa, their own desires as their ilah, who they obey. لا يستطيع لا يستطيعون نصرهم وهم لهم جند محضرون. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says they don't have the ability, the capability, istitaa to help you. I mean, you can worship a piece of wood or stone all your life. How can it help you? If you remember the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he he broke the idols and said, if they couldn't help themselves. Use your mind. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling us, use your mind. Who gave you the mind? How can they help you? They have no. Bahum lahum jundum muhdarun, and they will be an army present for them. Allah is talking about on the day of judgment and in Jahannam. That the Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the, the in the hadith, the Rasul Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when Allah gathers all the people on the day of judgment, He will say. Let everyone follow what they worship. So the idols will be brought, and the people will follow them. The cows will be brought, and people will follow them. Anyone who followed anything, whether you followed a messenger, in the worship them. Okay. So they will be told, and you will go with them. And then we know the fuel of fire is men and stones. The stones are the ones idols that were worshipped. So they will be presented to them, and the people will say, "Look, we expected you to help us. We expected VIP treatment because we worshipped you." They are going to respond. Allah will give them the power to say, "We are going into the fire, and we will be fuel to burn you because you worshipped us instead of Allah." Now imagine a fire that burns stones. We've mentioned this before. Normally, when you build a campfire, when you want to put it out, finally, besides, if you don't have water, what do you do? You put stones on them and it puts it out. There, the stones will be burning more like lava. Imagine, because stones become softer at a certain, you know, 2,000 degrees, 3,000 degrees Celsius, they melt and they flow, lava. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has shown us that sign also in the dunya. So if you think it's not going to happen, look right here on the dunya, it's happening. So everything that people worship will be brought, and they will be asked to follow them. And there's a very long hadith in Bukhari. If in the end, if we have time, which mentions all of this and what will happen and the bridge that is crossed and who's going to be left in the end. And uh, if we have time in the end, we will cover this hadith. Because it gives us the whole scene of the day of judgment. فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ قَوْلُهُمْ إِنَّا نَعْلَمُ مَا يُسِرُّونَ وَمَا يُعْلِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So, لَا يَحْزُنْكَ قَوْلُهُمْ Don't let their words, their speeches, cause you grief. Cause who grief? Rasulullah sallallahu Don't let, because they would say things that would hurt him, cause him grief. He said, don't let their words hurt you. And you remember this in the beginning anyway? This is a reassurance to Rasulullah. You are the messenger of Allah. Don't worry about what they say. In the beginning what was said? Reassuring. You are indeed. And the same reassurance reminding us of that. Okay. Inna na'lamu ma yusiruna wa ma yu'alinu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, we know what they hide, means what they don't say, what's in their hearts, and what they say out loud, what they say to each other. In other words, everything is open, and this was also mentioned that nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will. 
recompensate people for the words they said. Words are very, very important. We talked about one word. One word, a single word, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, could make a person fall into the depth of Jahannam. A word that he thought was not significant. We give the example like a fly sat on his nose and he just did this. Nothing. One word can make that. And a word of kufr and a word of ridicule of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Think of the gravity of that. How weighty it is in terms of a sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we know what they conceal and what they reveal. Now again, similar style. أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّ خَلَقْنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ Again, that تَعَجُّبْ أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانُ Does insan not see anna that we خَلَقْنَاهُ We created him. مِن نُطْفَةٍ From despicable dirty drop of fluid. Did this come before? What was one of the main things that people rejected the message? Arabs. Kibr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the counter dose for Kibr. You are so arrogant to reject my message and my messenger? Look. Look at your origin. What I made you from. فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمُ مُبِينٌ And then I made you into who you became. And you became so arrogant. خَصِيمُ مُبِينٌ That you stand like an open adversary, an opponent to me. The one who created you from the... Look at your origin. Where is your arrogance coming from? Isn't it strange that you were this? A dirty drop of fluid. And now you have the, the gall... To challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His word and His messenger? Awalamiyah, do you not see this? How strange is this? And Khasimum Mubin, clear opponent. We will not accept this, we will reject this, we will fight you. Fighting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, that's the ultimate. Wanting to assassinate, making fun of him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again reminding them. And many, many ayats in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds of this. أَلَمْ نَخْلُكُكُمْ مِمَّا إِمَّهِينَ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينَ إِلَىٰ قَدَرٍ مَعْلُومٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Mursalat, Did we not create you from a despised drop of water and we placed you in a place of safety in the wombs of your mother? For a known period determined, which is gestation, Allah is reminding us. Inna khalaqna al-insana min nutfatin amshaj. In surah, insan, we studied. Allah says, we created you from a drop of mixed fluid. That's it. That's your origin. And what's your end? Dirt. Mud. That's your beginning. That's your end. Where is the arrogance? Where is room for arrogance? And as one sheikh once said, when he met an arrogant man, who was a khalifa of the time, so he met this saintly person, wali of Allah, and he said, you don't treat me, you don't bow to me, you don't you know, give me, he said, why should I? He said, I am the Khalifa. He said, what? He said, what do you think of me? Don't you know who I am? He said, yes, I know who you are. He said, your origin was dirty fluid. Your end is dirt. And in between, you're a carrier of waste. Which is the factual truth. Then where is the arrogance? That's our reality. That's our reality. 
وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلقه قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم again the same thing goes back what was the biggest argument that the Quraysh had in the beginning how can the dead be brought to life again Allah summarizes that he says وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا and he has put forth for us a parable when نَسِيَ خَلْقَ and he forgets his own origin and arrogantly he says مَنْ يُحْيِي الْأَضَامَ who is going to bring these bones back to life that have rotted away and become dust وَهِيَ رَمِينَ just scattered dust. If you remember, uh, one of the Quraysh, in one narration it says his name was Ubay ibn Khalaf, that he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's one of the leaders, he brought some rotting bones and he crushed them like this dust in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa like this. He said, you tell me that this, when we become this, we are going to come back to that. And what was the response of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you remember? He said, yes, you will be brought back to life and then you will be entered into Jahan. Straight. Is it difficult to imagine that Allah can bring back something from Why not? No, leave, leave, leave what Allah has taught us, but logically. Mm -hmm. You see signs of death and we see coming back to life. Okay? Logically, we didn't exist, right? In the beginning we didn't exist, we came into existence. So we were created from? Two nuclei coming together. So can not the genetic codes of the bones and things, because now you are fully developed, can you not be brought back from that? They can identify bones. They can do DNA analysis and tell you where it comes from. It's a male or a female or this, that, what age, when they died. It's all there, written within the bones, within the... Hair, one hair, you know, one of the most uh, greatest evidence on sites of crime is they find one hair. And from that one hair, they can trace exactly everything. Who put that information in that hair? We take, for, we know, everybody knows that the fingerprints are different, right? Every cell is unique. That's how the DNA analysis. Every cell in your body is different than every cell in my body. The sequences. Retinal patterns are different. Each hair it looks the same. You go to the hairdresser, all the hair cut there look the same. Each hair is unique. Everything about each one of you is unique. Imagine the creator who has made every single one of you unique. It's not just the fingerprints. It's not just the retinal patterns. Everything. That's why now they have DNA analysis, you know, Ancestry.com and this.com and that. Everybody's making money on it because we are unique. You know, it's only because of the forensics that now we've come to learn. That it's not just a matter of, you know, I put my fingerprints on the site of the crime and erased it, I'm good. If one hair dropped there from you, that's enough to identify who it was. Imagine what precision Allah has created in each one of us. SubhanAllah. It's amazing. And each cell of ours, you know, how many billions, how many I don't even know what the what billions, billion, trillions of cells there are in each person's body. Each one. Because each nucleus has your genetic, your genetic code. 
which is slightly different, then your mother's genetic code and your father's genetic code and your son's genetic code and your daughter's genetic code and your sibling's genetic code. Think. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, think. So one who can do all of these complexities, and then Allah says, do you think you are more complex than the heavens that he has created? With all the trillions of galaxies, is that greater or your creation? In other words, that is greater. So who can do all of this? Now you think he cannot bring something back from little specks of bone. It makes no sense logically to doubt it. So even though you don't believe as, as a Muslim, but because you are Muslim, but logically, scientifically, if you look, evidence is overwhelming. That's why they make movies out of it. That from, you know, some dead mosquito, they are creating dinosaurs, remember? Take that gene. <coughs> what was the name of the movie? Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Another one is coming. Yes, I'm not sort of advertising for it. <laughs> قُلْ يُحْيِي قُلْ يُحْيِي هَلَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ So this man says that we cannot be created from this, we will not be resurrected. قُلْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ Say to them, what? يُحْيِي هَلَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً What? That he who gave you life the first time, will give life again. Awwala marra. First time who gave you life, will give life to these dead bones again. There is resurrection. Wa huwa, and he, bi kulli khalqin alim. And he knows everything about all of creation. Alim. Alim. He knows everything. In that is implied that Allah knows where the last molecule of your bones from which He is going to recreate you, which is from the tailbone, ends up. Whether it was buried in West Spring in Enfield, whether it was buried in Karachi, whether it was buried with the Titanic, whether it was anywhere. They, it will remain because whatever is created remains in different forms. From there, Allah's command will come and all of those components will be brought together. There's a very interesting hadith. Rasulullah said that there was a man who when he was dying, told his family after I die, burn me. People incinerate me, whatever ashes are left, you scatter them over the oceans and in the land. Everywhere you scatter them. So when he died, that's what they did. They took parts of it, put it in the rivers, into the oceans, into the land, here, there, everywhere. Just imagine. Allah will resurrect him on that day. And he's going to be in a state of shock. Okay, why did he? Allah will say, what did you instruct your family? He said, Ya Allah, I instructed them to do this. Allah SWT will say, why did you say that? Why did you do that? You know what his response would be? He said, because I was afraid to stand in front of you. So this way I thought it would be scattered everywhere and I would not be. I was afraid to stand in front of you. Allah says, go you are forgiven. Because you were afraid to stand in front of me. That is a sign of your Iman. And that's why you took all of this precautions. Also tells us that no matter how it is, you will be brought back. It also tells us about what? The infinite. Forgiveness and mercy of Rahmah of Allah So is there hope for people who are gathered here who believe in Him and you believe in this? Of course, we should be full of hope of Allah's mercy and His forgiveness. He 
He who created you for the first time will give life to these bones and he knows everything. الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّجَرِ الْأَخْضَرِ نَارًا فَإِذَا أَنْتُمْ مِنْهُ تُوْقِدُونَ and this is a very interesting ayah. Alladi, he is the one who jala lakum min shajaril akhdari, who created for you from green trees. Akhdar, green. Shajara, you know, shajar. Nar, fire. Fa ida antum minhu tuqidun. And you kindle the fire. Now, do you know what a tree is? The young ladies can go because we're at an adult level. If you want later, you can come back. You guys can go and have some fun. That's okay. Because we can only address either the adults or the children. Last 10 minutes, we can call them and talk at their level, inshallah. If you want to go play, please go ahead. I don't want you to get bored. It's okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he is the one who produces for you fire out of a green tree. What is the component of a tree? Green tree, that's a lie. How much water? A lot. Does anybody know? Depending on the type of tree, the average is 60% is water. Some of them, like bamboos and things, there are even more. Some of them are 80% water. These mighty trees standing there, up that high, that's water. You take the water out of them, they will wilt and ultimately die. Now isn't it interesting that we put out fire with water and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I created for you fire from green trees. Can you have a dead tree to light fire without it having been green at some point? Can you? Can you have a dead tree without it having been green at some point? There would be no tree. There would be no tree. For it to be there, it had to be alive at some point. Therefore, it was all full of water. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to dry, drain the water, and then it became wood, which we burn as firewood all the time. Okay. Did Allah SWT mention trees anywhere else in the Surah Yasin before? Nakhla, Nakhla, dead palm trees, referring to Jannah. So with one tree, Allah SWT reminded us of Jannah, of his favors in Jannah. Now here is another tree by which he is reminding us of Jahannam fire. Isn't it interesting? And then another interesting thing he says, Antum minhu tuqidun. You light the fire. The tree does not burn itself. You light the fire. What does that mean? imply that the tree was not meant to be it is your actions that light change that tree into a fire it is your actions which will make the fuel of the hellfire the tree itself is for benefit something to reflect so now every time we look at a tree it should remind us of all of these things Look at the trees differently. Did everybody grasp what I was trying to convey? I don't know. Yes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created trees for us, right? They're always start off green. From the first shoot that sprouts, germinates from the seed, it's green and tender. And then they become these huge massive trees that I see up there. And most average 60% of that is water. They're not meant to burn by themselves. Then when they dry up, 
Some of them you can light for fire. You have to do it, light for fire. Sometimes you can take, there are certain trees which you can rub with each other and it creates fire. Just like stones can. Interesting. Stones also, which are going to be in the fire of Jahannam, you can create fire, spark, flint stones, remember? So Allah is telling us that the tree becomes a fire by your action. And this fire reminds us of the greater fire, which is there because of your actions. Because you were created to be, you were created in Jannah to be in Jannah. But you do actions that take you to the other side. So two trees are mentioned in the Quran. One reminds us of Jannah, one reminds us of the hellfire. I think some of you should go and do a little research, Google about trees, what they're made of, how much water there is, what percentage there is. I looked at it some time ago. Average 60%, but some of them are more. But, you know, trees like bamboo, and there are some in, in Arabia that are have much more water, it drips out of them. You go to some of the rainforests, they just oozy, drip, 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 drip. So, we should remind ourselves from every tree that we see, what we should be and what we should not be, what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. Ayah number 81. أَوَلَيْسَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بِقَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَيْنْ يَخْلُقَ مِثْلَهُمْ بَلَىٰ وَهُوَ الْخَلَّاقُ الْحَلِيمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَيْسَ الَّذِي is he not the one who created the heavens? How many heavens are there? Seven. Wal Ard and the earth. Bekadirin by his creative ability. How many heavens have you seen? Just one. But we said there are six others. How do we know there are six others? By revelation. Are the others considered something we have seen? Or are they matters of the ghaib unseen? Unseen. We don't know. The width and all of that we have from the hadith of how they are and how they are. So Allah is saying He is the one who created the heavens. And the earth. So if you take it literally, heavens and the earth, yes, we know Allah created. But it also implies that He created everything that is unseen. Samawat. And everything that is seen, we see the earth. So this also implies everything that is unseen and everything that's seen is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And is he not able to create something like it? Mithlahum. Because Allah will recreate the universe in a different way, or we don't even want to call it universe, what comes in the hereafter. So Allah is asking the question Is he not who created the heavens and the earth able to create something like it again? The answer is Bala. Which is a way of saying, yes, of course. And Allah Himself answers by saying, Bala. Wa huwal khallaqul alim. He is khallaq, which is the, the, the superlative of creator, creation. You know, the greatest creator, alim, the one who knows. He is the all knowing supreme creator. So have no doubt that Allah can do what He wants. إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَقُولَ Do you remember here what this means? إِنَّمَا only أَمْرُهُ His command, His أَمْرُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا When He wants 
arada, when he makes an intent, if we, if we use the word intent, because intent for us is different, intends to do a thing, and yakula lahu, he just says, kun, fayakun, and it is. In other words, that's telling you that anything is possible with Allah, and it is possible, and it happens with ease. It doesn't take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a big struggle to do this. In other words, to bring you back is going to be ease for Allah. He created everything. You know? So, this also takes us back in the beginning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about giving death and destroying. What does, did he say? It would take only illa sayhatan wahida. One shout and everything will be destroyed. That's bringing death. And here it's saying, in one kun, life. Everything is instantaneous and easy for Allah. So why do you doubt that these bones will come? Why do you doubt there is going to be a resurrection? Innama amruhu ida arada shayya. An yaqula lahu kun. The word of Allah kun will give life. Which other word gives life to the dead hearts? The other word of Allah, which is the Quran. Right? That's what gives life to the dead hearts, to bring them back to. So the word of Allah destroys everything. The word of Allah brings back to life. That's it. And Allah has given us 6,000 plus words as guidance for us, and we still have problems. One word. Kun. And there are lots of. We talked about kun in the beginning in earlier sessions about two, three years ago. But some said the dot of the noon is all it is. Kun. Noon. You know, some people said noon wal kalam. This is an oath about the word kun. The smallest thing in writing is the dot, dot of the noon. But before even the dot of the noon, if you draw this and before you can dot it, Allah's command has been fulfilled. You can instantly, like in a, if you can see in a nanosecond or if there's something smaller than that, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have no doubt. In a hadith narrated by Sayyidina Abu Dar radiallahu anhu, he said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah the Exalted says, O oh my servants, all of you are sinners. All of kullukum mudnib, dhanab, sin. You're all sinners. Except whom I protect from sin. So we think we are protecting ourselves, it's Allah who is protecting us. Okay? Seek my forgiveness and I will forgive you. And all of you are in need except for those whom I make independent. Allah SWT makes some people independent, relatively. I am the most gracious, majestic, and I do whatever I will. My giving is a word. Kun. And my punishment is a word. When I want a thing to happen, I merely say to it, Kun. This kun fayakun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow to the believers in Jannah. In what form? The moment you think, you have make an arada or you have a, you think of something, it will be there. Imagine that. We will give that as a gift to the people of Jannah. Remember, so many. The moment you think of something, it's there.
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here has mentioned samawat and earth, or pairs, you know. Sir or alaniya, hidden, unseen and seen, pairs. Talked about water and fire, all, you know, all kinds of dead trees, life, everything in pairs Allah has mentioned, mentioned. Everything he created, as he says in the Quran, in pairs. And then what does he say? Except, everything is in pairs except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, the last ayah, after mentioning all of this, فَالسُبْحَانَ الَّذِي بِيَدْهِ الْمَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ فَالسُبْحَانَ Glory be Allah is above everything that you can think, imagine. There is no pairs with Allah, He is alone. Subhana. Who? Alladhi بِيَدْهِ mulk. The one in whose hand is the kingdom of everything. Heavens, earth, galaxies, seen, unseen, created, uncreated, everything in his hand. His control in his hand. Malakut, majority of scholars have said that this includes time, past, present, future, everything that's known, everything that's created, Anything that's in the physical realm, which is called mulk, by according to some, and everything that's in the spiritual, non-material realm, which is some have called that malakut. But others have said that it encompasses the yadihil. In his is the malakut, includes the unseen and seen, spiritual, physical, everything that you can have, is in his hand. Kulle shay. Kulle shay means anything you can imagine, anything that exists, that existed, that's extinct, that will exist in the future, everything. After reminding us of his great power and who he is, he ends with the same thing which the believer, when he was killed, what happened to him? In the story section 2, he returned to Allah immediately. And they said, we are not going to return. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa turja'oon. And to him, subhanah, you will all be returned instantly. You and me will be returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No doubt. And if there is no doubt, our lives should reflect that. Because we should be prepared to meet Allah subhanahu as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teaches us that the one who loves to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is looking forward to meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah loves to meet. And the one who doesn't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah doesn't want to meet. And who would want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The one who has led his life according to commandments. Because now he knows, now it's time for Allah's reward and meeting with him, and Allah will be pleased with me. So he looks forward, let's go. Malakul Maut, come on, let's go. Why, why did you take so long? I've been ready, prepared. And the one who's led a life of disobedience, of sinfulness, of neglect, of ghafla, doesn't want to. It's too attached here. I don't want to leave. Allah doesn't want to meet him. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who look forward to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. And it's not just a word. To do that, we have to lead our lives that reflect that. And our lives that reflect resurrection, qiyamah, hisab. That I will stand fardan farda, each individual in front of Allah without any representative, without any lawyer representing me, nobody. With my deeds, the only thing that will come is with my deeds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, that, O oh my ibad, O oh my servants, I own you, but I give you free will. To lead your lives whichever way you want. But I'm telling you, you are coming back to me. And I will take into account your account, how you spent your life 
how you spend the time, how you spend your youth, how you spent your money, where you earned it, what you did with the time I gave you, the resources I gave you, the children I gave you, the parents I gave you, the business, the wealth I gave you, what did you do with it? Did you fulfill the rights of everybody? Did you fulfill the rights of your parents and grandparents? Did you fulfill the rights of your children, the rights of your spouses, your husbands and wives? The, the rights of your relatives, Rahm, who are related to you. The rights of your business partners. The right of this earth that I gave you. The rights of the heavens that I created. The rights of the trees over you. The rights of the animals over you. That I allowed you to eat. How did you slaughter? How sharp was your knife? Yahsan, even in sacrifice. If you remember that hadith of the Prophet wasallam. He saw one man sacrificing animals who are lying there in blood and other animals are standing there. And he's got a knife which is cutting, he's going like this. It's not the sharpest of knife. Rasulullah sallallahu said what to him? That you have killed them twice because they are seeing what's going to happen. So they're dying from it and then you're doing this. He said when you kill an animal, keep the others that don't see it and sharpen your knife. So there is no suffering because Allah has made this halal for you. Otherwise it would be haram for you. Even in the slaughter there is ihsan. The animals should not see blood. They shouldn't see other animals being killed. And then you do it quickly in the name of Allah. So if there is ihsan in, in taking a life, ihsan in everything else we do. Relationship with each other. Ihsan in how we deal with the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ihsan in how we, we uh, deal with the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have people hesitating when we hear Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah. They have hesitation saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How stingy can we be? So over and over, the book of Allah, the message, the dhikr. Dhikr is something that reminds, that's why, over and over, same message of revelation, revelation, resurrection, again, hisab, jah, jannah, jahannam, previous, all of that reminder over and over, so you don't forget, you don't lead a life of ghafla forgot, not even for a moment, because that could be the moment that Malakul Maat comes and we are in ghafla. But a person who's always in remembrance, when he sees that the last moment, Malukul Maut, what's he going to say? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ahlan wa sahlan. So if we lead our lives that way, then inshallah, Allah will enable us to die in that state. And He will allow us to be resurrected in that state of Iman. And then the enjoyment will start. And we will remember some of these gatherings. We will remember these gatherings. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to take this seriously, not just every other Wednesday, but every day in between, and every hour of every day in between. Every heartbeat is evidence for or against us. If you're an athlete, your heart's beating 50 times a minute. If you're a normal person, 70, 80, 90 times, every beat is evidence. Ya Allah, when, and that beat never comes back, the next beat comes. Like just each second doesn't come. That second is gone, it's recorded. That beat is gone, Ya Allah, I, I did, you know, your, the node that generates the electricity to contract that muscle will bear witness, your parts of the body will, Ya Allah, I did what you asked me to do. I pumped the blood so he could remember you and glorify you and obey you. Ask him if he fulfilled the rights because I worked. It's a serious matter, but a matter full of hope, full of promise. I mean, how many jobs we take, how much we study for, you know, your people going. Bachelors, how many years? Four plus 16 years. Masters and PhDs. 
medical school. Why? Because we see the reward that's going to come to the end of it. If somebody was to tell you that you, you go through school and you do you know, medical school, then you do specialization. After that, we'll put you as a, as a gatekeeper you know, to clean our cars. He said, why do I have to go through all of that? I see the reward, so I do things. No, Allah is putting the reward in front of you. That's the reward. If you go through some struggle, some striving, some difficulties, just remember the reward and it should rejuvenate, it should give you energy. I am working for Jannah. I'm not working for something ordinary. I'm working for Allah's rida, His pleasure. If I have to suffer, if I have to take some difficulty, if I have to wake up from deep sleep at Fajr time, no problem. I'm going to jump out of bed because I'm working for Jannah. So if we understand what Jannah is, if we understand how Allah will treat us, then the difficulties become small. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to realize all of this and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the people who listen to words of admonition, of warning and follow the best of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the people of Samana wa Ta'ana, we hear and we obey. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the true followers who do ittiba of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who are sincere, people of ikhlas. We are not here to impress anyone. We are here to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Surah Yaseen, the heart of the Quran, in our hearts. Not just by memorization, but the message. And may our lives reflect that. Ameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa nastaghfiruk wa natubu.